My name is Reed McMillan. I'm a Sloan Fellow from 2009, and it is my privilege to introduce our speaker, Professor Deborah Ancona. Um, professor Ancona is the Seely Distinguished Professor of Management, a professor of organization studies, and the founder of the MIT Leadership Center at the MIT School Sloan of uh, <laughs> MIT Sloan School of Management. Her pioneering research into how successful teams operate has uh, highlighted the importance of managing outside as well as inside uh, the team's boundary. This research directly led to the concept of X teams as a vehicle for driving innovation within large organizations. And she has a new book on this. Um, her work also focuses on the concept of distributed leadership and on the development of research-based tools, practices, and teaching pra practices and teaching and coaching models that enable organizations to foster creative leadership. Professor Ancona joins us today to talk about her latest leadership, uh, late latest leadership practices, including the five things we need to know about leadership in today's world. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, all. Welcome back. It's very nice to some familiar faces, so not so familiar faces. And um, I'm going to be going over uh, a number of things, uh, what I like to call the five greatest hits from the MIT Leadership Center. Uh, some of you have heard some of these before, some of you not. So for those of you, um, for whom I'm repeating things, it's actually probably a good idea because you're at least a year out and the brain decays very quickly. So um, uh, in fact, people who saw this may not realize that they have seen it before, which is all good too. So we'll just, we'll just plow on in whatever, in whatever way works uh, for us. So um, this talk was originally published as From Pyramids to Networks, Distributed Leadership in Action, uh, but I change the title name for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is we're going to talk more about leadership than the shifting structure from pyramids to networks, uh, but also because we have a new article coming out this summer on distributed leadership in action, and the publisher said under no um, in no way, shape, or form can we use this word distributed leadership because no one knows what it means and it's kind of a mouthful. So uh, instead, we're calling it nimble leadership. That's what this article is going to be called. Nimble leadership walking the line between creativity and chaos, five things you need to know. So um, kind of boiling down a whole lot of actually years and years of research into five key points that I hope uh, you will leave with and be able to use. The premise of all of this work is that we are living in exponentially changing times. When you all were here, very often in organizational processes, we would talk about VUCA, uh, the volatile, uncertain, changing, ambiguous, complex world, the VUCA world. Uh, we talk about that a lot. Well, now it's VUCA on steroids. Now we're very variable and uncertain, but it's moving much faster than it ever has before. So it's VUCA on steroids, and that's what we call exponentially changing times. So in these exponentially, ta uh, exponentially changing times, what is it that we have to do as leaders? And just to get us in the mood, uh, there's a video I like to show. OK, let's get to peace and room. and. Just to get us into the anxiety of what it is to live at this moment in time. OK, I'm going to stop it there. Um, as the parent of a student graduating tomorrow, that last bit of data is always encouraging that they're <laughs> basically <laughs> out of date before they even graduate. That's always a good sign. Um, anyway, uh, and this is five years old. Uh, if anyone is interested in this video, it's called Did You Know? You can find it on YouTube. And there is a 2019 version. I don't like it as much because it doesn't have the music, which raises anxiety in everybody. And so um, I just like that because that's the world we're living in. It's moving, and it's moving uh, 
in a way that does create anxiety and stress and uncertainty uh, on the parts of lots of people in, in organizations today. And so what are the implications for leading in this exponentially changing world? Uh, we've been talking about going from the old to the new for quite a long time, from the command and control, bureaucratic, inflexible hierarchies of old to the more agile, self-organizing, distributed, collaborative, et cetera, kind of world, an organizational um, practice for quite a long time. That's been the rhetoric. What has been missing, really, is what is it you actually do? We can talk about it. We know that this transformation is happening. And every organization, I do a lot of work in exec ed here at Sloan, and almost every organization that comes in to, to look at change here is trying to make this transition. So we've had to really wrestle with what does it mean to make this transition? What do people and organizations need to do? And so again, the five things. First thing is to be able to know and communicate your leadership signature. So leadership signature is a term that we coined here at the MIT Leadership Center. Your leadership signature is very simply your unique way of leading. What is your thumbprint? What is your signature when it comes to leadership? Because leadership is personal. There's not one way to lead. We all lead best based on who we are, our personalities, our values, uh, what, we, what we care about, uh, the experiences that we've had. So what is your leadership signature? And are you able to communicate it? Because in a world that's rapidly changing, you're going to be dealing with lots of new people, with lots of new teams, with people in different countries, with people in different continents, with people in different um, areas of expertise. So how do you begin to work with other people? They have to have some sense of who you are so that they can more easily work with you. So what is your leadership signature? What I want to do is just play a couple of videos of some leaders who just in a couple of minutes say some things about who they are as leaders. It's not a formal speech. I and mean, we do a lot of work here on being able to tell your leadership story. But you don't need a full-fledged course. You can just say, OK, what is it that I want to tell people to let them know who I am, what I care about, what my organization is centered on? How do I do that? And so we'll hear from two people, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, who came in in 2014 and has really shown the way for many new ways of um, managing this transformation. And then we'll look at Eileen Fisher, the founder of Eileen Fisher, which is a for people who don't know, a clothing uh, company uh, that was started a while ago is quite innovative and, and interesting. So uh, we're going to watch just a couple of minute tapes. And then I'm going to ask you, what have they communicated just by taking two minutes to tell you something about who they are as leaders? What do you learn from that? Okay, Sacha Nadella. He, he is currently the CEO of Microsoft. Before becoming CEO of Microsoft, he was Executive Vice President of Microsoft Cloud and Enterprise Group. He's Sacha Nadella, and here are his top 10 rules for success. I think more than anything else, perhaps, what defines me is, uh, and this I've also understood exposed, um, is I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, I get energized when I see people achieve high standards in anything. Uh, at work, when somebody comes to me with an idea that they've implemented and it's something that I've not seen before, that's the thing that gets me going. I, you know, as I say, I buy more books than I can finish. I sort of sign up for online courses uh, more so than I can actually finish them, but I love it. Uh, and thank God for these new online courses where they even have 10 minute segments, so at least a, a sense of accomplishment is much easier. It's like um, a new cliff notes. Yeah, I wish I had it when I was growing up. But I think that that is uh, perhaps more than anything else uh, that gives me uh, the energy. And it's not just the learning for learning's sake. What I think we all in business in particular thrive in is applied learning. Uh, to be able to take that, uh, create products, create programs, approaches to how we work with customers and partners, uh, and excelling in them, and being able to sort of both uh, do that and more importantly learn from others who are doing it is what I would say uh, defines me the most. Okay, just 
quick, you know, who are you? Um, two minutes. What did you learn about Satya Nadella as a leader? Uh, cure, yeah, uh oh, come on, guys. You, you haven't been out of the classroom that long. Let's um, <laughs> let's see some some hands up here. Okay, curious, curious. Yes. I'm going to just ask you because we are trying to to uh, have everybody here and tape this loud. Really project. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so it was about lifelong learning, but what was more interesting was that it was the learning he took outside the organization. He said, I'm interested in finding things I can take to customers or other partners. It was not, I want to focus inside, I want to focus outside. OK, I want to focus outside. And that outside is going to be part of what we are going to focus on today, is the importance of outside. The importance of not only first learning from others outside, but then applying that learning, not just to within the organization, to, but to the external network that surrounds the organization, the larger ecosystem. Yes, the word of the moment is ecosystem. So, so learning from that ecosystem and then taking the learning out to the ecosystem. What else? What else do we learn about? As an implicit message to everyone who would want to understand his leadership, he's suggesting they ought to do the same thing, right, as a model. As a model, you ought to be doing the same thing. And by the way, if you're working for Satya Nadella, what do you know? You know that when you talk to him, what? He has the short attention span, OK. And so what does that mean? When you go into his office to talk about something, get it done, say it quickly. None of this let's talk for a few minutes before I get to my point. We want to get to that point right away. Uh, anything else that comes out of that? Yes, here. He here. gets energy and he's going to be motivated to work with you if he's learning something. At the same OK, time. is he learning something? Can you present what you're doing as something new and do it in a highly energy? This is not the person to speak to like this, right? You, right. Want, to, you want to be energized because he's energized. And so you want to match or mirror some of that energy. Or Maybe pull him down a little bit, but but match it uh, in in some way, shape, or form. It was idea of becoming and constantly be ahead of that curve, ahead of change. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, anyone else? What else do we? Um, anything else we learned from him? Does he care about what he's doing? Yes. How do you know that? How do you know he has passion? How do you show passion as a leader? It's on his face. It's in his body. He's forward. He's moving. He's going a mile a minute because he cares about what it is he's speaking about. What are you communicating in your leadership signature? Not just what you say, but how you say it, but how you act when you're talking about it. All of these are really important in this day and age because we don't have a lot of time to get to know people. So people are reading signals. People say the biggest um, spectator spot is sport is soccer or it's football. It's not. It's leadership. Everybody's watching leaders all the time to get cues and signals. You see a new CEO come in, everybody change their outfit. It changes their outfits because the old one was a schlump and the new one cares about the wardrobe. And by the way, every, ta every clothing store in the, in the town uh, has repeat customers all over the place because people are reading leadership all the time. So what are you projecting as those people are reading you? How are you projecting it? Are you seeming motivated and passionate or are you kind of well, whatever. Um, it's important. Think about what it is. OK. Oops. Sorry. OK, let's move to Eileen Fisher. She's the founder of the Eileen Fisher Incorporated um, and very different kind of leader. So just a few minutes on her. It's very interesting because you talk about collaboration. You talk about purpose. You talk about values. And yet, the business that you're in, <laughs> the fashion, um, is one like many others that at least the stereotype is that this right. can be somewhat cutthroat, yeah. uh, very yeah. competitive, yeah. Um, very diva-like uh, oh, in, yeah. in some ways. Uh, uh, and so, I'm a terrible how, diva. <laughs> <laughs> how does one survive in the industry yeah. with a very different approach to business? Well, it's funny because I often, I really don't actually think of myself as a fashion designer or even in a fashion business, uh, partly because I wasn't trained that way. So I think of myself as a designer or a clothing designer, and I think of myself as trying to solve a problem 
you know, and help help women feel better in their in, their, in themselves and in their clothes, and um, make make it simpler to get dressed in the morning and go to work and be comfortable. Sometimes people call me the anti-fashion designer because I think of myself as what I'm really passionate about is timeless design. I'm always trying to, you know, create something that belongs to the moment, but that will, uh, you know, transcend the test of time, will, will withstand the test of time. When I first started the business, I was very taken with the kimono. I had an opportunity to go to Japan, and the idea that people wore only one shape for a thousand years in Japan. That idea really, you know, sort of captured me, and I, mm -hmm. I wanted to create clothes that had that kind of staying power. Okay, very different approach, very different leadership. What did we learn about, about Eileen Fisher? What kind of leader is she? What's important to her? Yes? She's very mission and purpose driven in a, in a space of fashion where you have H&I and fast fashion. It's much about the purpose and solving a deeper problem. Solving, she's a problem uh, solver uh, and, and trying to solve the problem of, of design that lasts very different from, yes, this new model that's, that's taking over. So very clear. And again, passion, passion in a different way, right? Uh, what she does here is really, really great. She shows you with the kimono. She leaves you with an image. The extent to which you can leave people with an image that somehow represents a key idea about you is a great thing to do, because you will now remember the kimono, right, as a symbol of timeless design. Anything else? Anything else that we have to? She really wants to uh, convince you. She, she stares at you with the whole interview. You know, the Saturday night I was watching all over the place, and she's constantly looking at you. She is looking at me. She, when she does something, she focuses. Uh, and she's very clear that I'm here to talk to you. And, and that's an important part of the culture that she brings, that, that it's important in interpersonal relationships to really uh, listen and pay attention. And so she models that behavior for, for other, other people. Anything else about Eileen Fisher? What, what do we want to remember about her? Yeah? She can work at Microsoft. She can work at Microsoft? She Oh, she cannot work at Microsoft. <laughs> she probably cannot work at Microsoft. That would that would probably be true. But why would you say that? Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, she's the, she's the creative. She's a creative and a very different pace. A very different pace in her organization because it's about getting it right. It's about getting this timeless design right. And she really cares about this. Yes? She's also looking at long trends. Um, I think just that long attention span that the first gentleman did not have. Right. Um, so she has a long attention span. See, louder, louder. Uh, I don't think you could sort of woo her with flash. Um, I think she's really looking for content. Right. Content, not flash. So you, you better have your cards all set before you go in there to, to speak to her uh, and, and have it relate to the mission at hand. It can't be something off and running. It's this is what we're doing. This is what this company is about. This is what I'm about. And I don't mind, by the way, being a leader who goes against the crowd. I don't mind being someone who sets her own path because we've been successful doing that. And so what if everybody else is here? This is where we are. This is who I am. This is where we're going. Uh, so very clear on purpose and where it is the organization stands, and you need to be in there. Yes? It's also knowing kind of the end that they're in. Like, you know, he's in tech, so you have a lot of people that are quiet working behind computer screens. So you probably need someone energetic to get things out of that he's kind of excited. And they're always talking about future technology, so he's got this mentality. In fashion, fashion's already neurotic and psychotic. So if you have somebody that's kind of more even killed, that can just drop below the frequency and kind of bring that equalization, I think is super important. In addition, that she's kind of think of timelessness, because that's what maintains you in fashion, right? You have to have those signature pieces that people will come back and continually buy alongside, you know, kind of tearing in on that little cusp of trend. So right. I think it's really understanding mm -hmm. what you're doing and who your audience is. And, and, so, and to the point that context matters. Context totally matters. Um, so where are you and does your signature, one key question for you is, does my signature fit this context? 
because it may not, in which case, what does that imply? Maybe you need to be somewhere else, or maybe you need to shift a little bit about who you are. All right, two more, and then I want to move on. Well, to, to build on that, and maybe to, to pre present a bit of a, uh, another observation, as memorable as the kimono, she reframed, she's not in fashion, she's in design. And that struck me, and it made me think about that difference. Right, so another big thing that, that leaders do is framing. They frame the dialogue, they frame the discussion. What is it we're talking about here? How do we think about it? How do we look at it? Big, big part of what leaders do. Yeah? Uh, the way she speaks is very much aligned with what she's saying is the vision. So you know, the vision is a long-term goal vision. And she speaks very calmly. So you are very likely to believe that she believes in the vision. OK, so again, very different ways across the two leaders of embodying what they say and how they say it. Um, so again, um, what we're going to do, oops. OK. Um, all right, so quickly, turn to the person next to you and tell him three adjectives that describe your leadership signature now. If you, asked, if you don't know how to do that, think about if you asked others who work with you, how would they describe your leadership? What would they say? And then provide a couple of examples to bring the words to life. So uh, I'll give you just about five, six minutes, uh, three adjectives each with a story or two to back it up. Uh, so we'll get you started on communicating your leadership signature. I wish I could give you more time, but I want to I wanna move us along. Uh, so just take some notes uh, so you'll have homework to do when you're done here today to keep going on, on some of these things. OK, number three, leading through X teams. X teams are externally oriented teams. Um, so just let's get at your mental model. If I asked you what accounts for strong team performance, what makes a really good team, what would you tell me? What makes a great team? Yes? Psychological safety. OK, somebody has read Amy Edmondson and looked at that work. Great work she does. Um, so safe. Is it safe to say what you want to say? Is it safe to bring up uh, uncomfortable news in the team? You want to build that safety. What else? Yes. Focus. 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 The team is focused on what it needs to do. Great. Yes. Diversity. You want different skill sets, uh, different ways of thinking in the team to get your creativity going. That's what I answered. That's what you want to answer. OK, well, so you get the gold star for doing a double there. OK. Uh, so common goals that are the right goals. Common goals that are the right goals. So again, how to focus, you need to have a goal so that everybody is striving and that they're the right ones aligned uh, to, to what the team needs to do. Others, what else? Yes. Constructive conflict. Can we communicate? Can we manage conflict in the team? Commitment. Commitment. Are the team members committed to what you have to do? Time management. Time management. Can we get done what we need to do in the allotted time? We could keep going. I'm going to argue that what you just gave me is the traditional model of teams. It's the model of teams that's burnt into our brains that we spend billions, that's with a B, billions of dollars training all the time, and yet, this internal, this model that you've just given me is focused within the team. The, the lens of the camera looks inside the team to how members are interacting with one another and who's in there. It turns out that this model is only half right, and it's half right, it can be very, very wrong. What is the other half of the equation? That is the X in X teams being externally focused. So teams, to be successful in that exponentially changing world, A, have to get out there and do their scouting or sense making. Just like individuals, teams need to map their external context, not only outside the organization, but inside the organization. You guys remember those three lenses? that ring a bell anywhere along the line? You remember that political, strategic, and, and cultural world? The, the red and gray and white, I know. Uh, you're going, what <laughs> is she talking about? Um, anyway, those lenses are part of scouting. What's going on in the political environment, in the cultural environment? What's changing technology, et cetera, et cetera? You need to do that as a team, being contextually aware. Because the team needs to produce something that fits the environment. Teams also need to do ambassadorship, getting 
commitment and buy-in from people further up in the organization. They have to act as ambassadors uh, to, to link what the team is doing to the strategic focus of the unit or organization. So you want ambassadorship to get resources and buy-in and commitment from the top. And lastly, you need to coordinate with other parts of the organization. Most teams these days cannot do it alone. Uh, so if you look at, um, we actually did a Microsoft case that's part of the original research on this on the book. Um, and one of the teams working on product development, uh, they had a new software package, but it was going to do things that had never been done before. So they had to interconnect with uh, the technical part of the company, with people who did photos, because it was moving to more photo, um, joint photo albums. So they had to create their own ecosystem within the organization to coordinate the work that, that needed to be done. <clears throat> so it's coordination not just within the team, but between the team and outside groups. So all of these three things are what is necessary. If you want to have one thing to remember from this number three, it's out before in. Before you set your goals, figure out the expectations of your customer, of top management, of others around you. Before you decide what you're going to do, figure out what the parameters are and the expectations are. Before you get too embedded in a particular solution, you want to test possible solutions with, again, customers or others in the organization. Before you decide what compatibility means uh, for your particular product, you better check with the techie people to see if they're in agreement. Because when you make assumptions and you don't test them and coordinate, the whole thing can fall apart. So there's a huge amount of evidence that a more externally oriented team is going to do better. It's not that you throw out all the things we talked about. It's that you combine them. So X teams can connect people not only within the firm, but also across different organizations. This is the vehicle to create that connection in the ecosystem. OK, number four. Away from toxic leadership toward challenge-driven leadership. And challenge-driven leadership is leadership we see here at MIT. Uh, Hal Gregerson and I did a study of what is leadership at MIT. Because as you can well imagine, when we say the world leadership, nobody thinks about MIT. Everybody thinks about that institution up the river called Harvard. And so they, they're the ones who are saying, oh, you know, leadership, let's go to Harvard. But the fact of the matter is, that MIT has spawned over 30,000 companies worth over $1.9 trillion. That's trillion dollars. We are no saps when it comes to leadership. But we had to understand, yes, exactly. Hello there, guys. Um, so we wanted to understand like, what is MIT's brand of leadership, if you will. Uh, but I want to first start with toxic. How many of you have had toxic leaders in your careers? Right. So in the olden days, if I asked that question, there would not be so many hands up. Toxic leadership is on the rise. There are, in my field, organizational behavior, new research happening and expanding all the time on toxic leadership. If we look out in the world, the models that we see in the political arena in many different parts of the world, there are a lot of authoritarian kinds of leaders out there. So let's see what we don't want to be and then move to where we do want to be. What are the symptoms of toxic leadership? One is denigrating subordinates, being overcritical. You're never doing the right thing. Louder, louder, louder. A funny comment. Yesterday, my Uber driver, uh, when I was saying that I was going to the MIT reunion, he said, OK, you're on the good side. Because when I've been driving here for four years, I said, I can, and I'm interviewing all these people in my, my taxi. 50% of the, of the people from that come from, that, are, that I bring to HBS, they are, excuse me the word, they are assholes. <laughs> well, and, and, and when Bob, Bob's, oh, sorry, finish. Uh, backed up by, he said, well, this is not only me driving the text, but I actually later on had a conversation with a professor of HBS, and he confirmed it. <laughs> 
Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because Bob Sutton, who is a professor at Stanford, has written a, a very highly selling book. I highly recommend it. He has a new one out, too. It's called Don't Hire Assholes. I don't usually use that language in my classroom, but that's the title of the book. So there's really <laughs> little that you can do about it. I also it was really interesting. I was at a, a cocktail party, and there was the the uh, founder and CEO of a small investment banking company. I mean, so not finance is never your your sort of warm and fuzzy place to be. Um, but he has this very family-oriented atmosphere in the firm. So I said to him, well, how do you make that? How do you create that, and how do you maintain that? And he said, I don't hire assholes, and if I make a mistake, we get rid of them. And asshole is another way to talk about toxic leadership. So let's get a little bit more scientific about the situation at hand. Just saying, since there is a lot of research about that, and that's what we're about. We have the facts and the data as well as the big picture. All right, so symptoms, denigrating subordinates, aggressive, immoral, callous, insensitive. Um, blaming others for problems. It's never my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always someone else out there. Hoarding information is another part. You don't give, it's not transparent, it's hoarding. And promoting self over others. So if you get the good idea, you're a good person, but I take the credit um, because I'm important and I'm good. The results of this are Others adapt the same behavior. So toxic leadership breeds toxic leadership. When you have a toxic leader, you see more and more people in that organization becoming toxic leaders. Decreased psychological well-being. These are people who do not feel good about being under this person's control or in this organization. The erosion of trust. I can't trust you because you're not looking out for me. You're looking out for you. And so trust goes way, way down. Retribution. There are people that put their heads down because that's a very good strategy for a toxic leader. You working for that person, put your head down, get your work done so that you can move as quickly as possible to, to another job maintaining yourself. Um, so people put their head down, but underneath it they're saying, how can I get back at this person because this has just been one of the, most, the worst experiences in my working career. Uh, and reduced effectiveness, although in the short term, working for a toxic leader, as I said, people put their nose to the grindstone and can work really hard, so you can ha see some increase in productivity, actually, with these toxic leaders. Um, so um, toxic leadership, the people, again, who study this, the psychologists who study this, have noted that they have this thing, the dark triad of personality. Is that the best terminology ever? There's actually a, a psychological score on the dark triad of personality. So what is the dark triad of personality that is correlated with toxic leadership? One is narcissism. Uh, toxic leaders tend to be narcissistic. They think they're better and more deserving than others. They seek attention and positive reinforcement, and they're aggressive if threatened. You don't want to threaten the, uh, the toxic or narcissistic leader. The second is Machiavellianism. That is, the toxic leader can be very cunning and trying to manipulate the political environment, keeping secrets, hoarding information, uh, manipulating things to keep power, building alliances, secret alliances with different groups that can change, that person can turn on you in a moment. So there's a, a manipulation due to Machiavellianism. And either psychopathy or psychopathy, pronounced differently in different places, is no impulse control. This, this is someone who doesn't um, kind of, it just happens. When you get going, you just move. So um, that's what we see. So the idea is we at MIT don't want to create toxic leaders. That's not the idea. The idea is that we have an alternative way of doing things. MIT's brand of leadership, interestingly, when we interviewed undergrads, we said, well, what, do you, you know, what about leadership? And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm not a leader. They, they don't even put leadership activities. They won't fill it in on their resumes. Why? Because for them, leadership is order-giving, narcissistic, Machiavellian jerks who are only interested in getting ahead in the organization, and that is not who they want to be. Challenge-driven leadership, the kind of leadership we see here, is leadership that's not about following the charismatic leader, here I am. It's 
we have to do something important here. There are problems and challenges that need to be solved, and that's what we're here to do. Come join me because this is something that needs to be done. Come and join me. We need a robot that's going to help people who lose their legs in combat. We need uh, whatever kind of technology is needed to clean up the oceans or to improve the air or to get batteries to work or to whatever it is. The, the amount of things being done by people here at MIT and in the work that's done when they get out is, is much more, not everybody obviously, but is much more about solving problems and meeting challenges and exciting and motivating people because of that. It's also about the team, not just about the self. So it's about stepping in and stepping out. Leaders from MIT know how to let others lead as their expertise is needed. You want a lot of experts there. You want the data. It's a very data-driven form of leadership. But it's also the ability to step in and step out, to get the right person there when you need that person. Uh, and so that's what we see in this MIT leadership. By the way, I haven't discussed this, but we have papers on all of these things, on sense making, on um, uh, well, we have some things on toxic leadership, uh, on um, this uh, challenge-driven leadership, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to just send some links to you, and you can right. do further reading on this as, as, you, as you like. So, so that's what we are. We're about meeting the challenge, stepping up and stepping out, getting people excited about the things that need to be done to make this uh, a better kind of, of world. Mm -hmm. that this um, Problem? Evil, evil leadership trait, <laughs> is that more common than others? Yeah, I don't want to go there. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, the data is that it's going up across the board. So mil studies in the military have shown an increase uh, in, in toxic leadership. Um, somewhere along the, the political uh, sphere, we, we see it a lot as to say, or notice it more. I don't know if it's we it's more prevalent or we see it more or we're better able to measure it, um, but certainly seeing increases there. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm not going to go there. Read the book um, um, by uh, by Bob. Bob Sutton has outlined this in 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 a lot more detail than than I have. Okay, the last thing is we've talked about what you have to do as an individual. We've talked about teams and how teams need to work and cooperate and collaborate. But how do you create the right environment of agility for agility and learning for dealing with that? that exponentially changing world. And the last thing is leader as architect. As the leader, you have to architect the system. You have to architect the team or the unit that you are operating in in order to have people stepping into leadership roles, in order for people to develop their leadership signatures, in order for X teams to be able to to work in the organizational environment. Uh, this is a paper, uh, as I said, that's coming out this summer. Um, now that we've had this conversation, I'm embarrassed to say it's coming out in Harvard Business Review, but maybe, <laughs> maybe we can teach them something from the, the Sloan School. That would be a good thing. Um, so the architect is creating the context, uh, architecting the context where decision making is top down and bottom up, where information is flowing and where innovation happens at multiple levels. Uh, in these firms that are able to innovate and adapt over long periods of time, we found three types of leaders. Um, entrepreneurial leaders, so even deep down in the organization, we find entrepreneurs who are saying, here's a better product, here's a better way for us to organize, here's a new business model. You have this bubbling up um, froth of innovation uh, because you've got a lot of entrepreneurial leadership, not just at the top, not just in the middle, but also at lower levels of the firm. These are the people who are doing the sense making. These are the people who are creating the X teams. These are the people who are coming up with problems and creating teams to solve those problems. They're the entrepreneurial leaders. But entrepreneurial leaders 
can create a lot of froth. And so you need enabling leaders to help to focus and coach and develop the entrepreneurial leaders. So as we move from order giving leaders to a more distributed, nimble system, you need enablers who coach them. So we see in companies that do this well that people um, who are a little bit more experienced might help a product development team to do their presentation to get funding for the products that they're creating, to do all, uh, all the things that they need to do. They also connect because what happens when you have lots of entrepreneurship is that you may have say this here, local um, optima as opposed to global, right? So somebody finds a problem, but maybe it's not good for the whole company. And so uh, what, what the enablers will do is connect people. They'll say, OK, you and you and you in different parts of the world are working on the same problem. I think you should get together and think about what's the best way to proceed. Or uh, this has already been done by such and such a group. Maybe you don't need to do what you're doing over there. Uh, so the enablers are helping to let the entrepreneurial leaders be the best they can be. And finally, these architecting leaders are creating the system that lets those other two kinds of leaders take place, but they're also monitoring what's going on and finding those global optima. So in one of the companies, WL Gore, that we were in, no, no single unit uh, had the advantage of going and, and manufacturing in Japan. But combined, there was a huge benefit to doing that. So at certain times, those, those architecting leaders will say, here's something that's for the betterment of the whole, and that's where we're going to go. They're also constantly looking around to say, where are their bottlenecks? And creating simple rules. This is kind of Kathy Eisenhardt and Don Sol's work, uh, creating simple rules. So too many engineers are working on little products, new simple rule. If it doesn't make 500 million in the environment, don't do it. Or too many people working on long-term projects. If you want to get funding for this quarter, it better be a short-term product. So ways of kind of focusing, not through a million bureaucratic rules, but for simple rules that deal with the problem at hand. Uh, so that's what architecting leaders are doing. Um, they're creating the game board, if you will, the game board for innovation. Now, there are a lot of things that we've learned about the game board of innovation, but instead we're going to do an exercise. And here it is follows. So here are some of the attributes of a nimble organization, a distributed leadership organization, whatever language you want to use. Um, so I'd like you guys to do the following. Oh, wait, this is, I keep trying to push it and it's automatic, so that's not working too well. Um, okay, let me, let me explain before you go. In pairs, and there are some people who are not affiliated with a pair, so become a triplet, that's okay. Um, first thing is, uh, uh, in pairs, have the first person look at all the attributes. That person should identify those that his or her organization currently has, identify those you would like to see in your organization, and then if you could change just three things, what would they be, and how could you work on changing that? Okay, you're going to have five minutes for one person, then switch. The other person does the same thing. Got it? So it's a way to sort of internalize and incorporate what we have found as architectural components of organizations that are really good at innovation and adaptation in a rapidly changing world. Got it? OK. You guys have 10 minutes. OK. OK. Um, let's just hear like a couple of a few adjectives um, from, t let's say, two from each part of the room just to get a sense of, of a flavor of the room. So just anyone go with one of their adjectives. Disarming. Disarming. Ooh, I never heard that, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of adjectives. I like that. Disarming. I'll keep them guessing. That's great. OK. What else? Other, other adjectives? Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. That's good. OK, get that energy going. Futuristic. 
futuristic. Okay, are we here or are we in the future? Great leaders spend more time than other leaders in thinking about the future. What is coming? Not just what is now, but where are we going? What's happening later? <coughs> Others, a couple more. Situational. Situational. So reading the environment, is that what that means? What is the situation? Yeah. Because it will require a different leader style, maybe. Okay, so the ability to read and change as, as needed. Okay, great. Okay, one from this side. <laughs> I don't know, guys. This is no. just like an adjective. Openness, great. Okay, openness. Being able to be open to what's happening. Okay, great. But what other capabilities are needed now? Again, this is an exponentially changing world. So one is you provide some stability in that exponentially changing world by being clear about who you are as a leader and being able to communicate it and having that clarity and consistency. The next thing, uh, some of you may recognize the 4K, the 4CAP model. Um, it's now the 4CAPS Plus model because we have to keep adding to it and changing things as time goes on. So uh, this is the new and accelerated version of the 4CAP model in a larger context. Um, and all of these are important, but the one that has changed the most in terms of its predictability of leadership effectiveness is sense making. Sense making, making sense of the context in which you are operating. Because if there's a changing context, you need to be able to read that environment and say, what is going on out there? What does it mean? What do I have to do? How do I have to function in that environment? So what does a sense maker do? First is open-minded. You need, as a leader, to be able to let go of your existing mental model to see what is there now. What is there now? So when Satya Nadella came into Microsoft, he had already been at Microsoft, and he was a great sense maker. Because the job before CEO for Satya Nadella was in cloud computing and artificial intelligence. He chose an area of the company that was not actually well recognized or seemingly relevant to the organization. But he read the environment and said, this is what is going to take off. This is what's going to change the industry. And that's why the board ended up coming to him to be the CEO, because he was ahead of everybody else in the technologies that were shifting the industry. When he got in to Microsoft, what's the first thing he did? The first thing he did was go on a sense-making tour talking to people, saying, what do you like about Microsoft? What do you not like about Microsoft? What's working? What's not working? And from that, he was able to diagnose, well, they have a stacked ranking system to evaluate people. And that's not leading to innovation. That's leading to people getting at one another and a lot of infighting. Is there anyone from Microsoft in the room, by the way? OK, well, you would be a resident expert, but if not, I'll just give you the example. So letting go of the old mental model uh, really required him to say, OK, what's different here? I've grown up in this organization, but things are different now than they were in the days of Gates, in the day days of Bomber. So what, what do I have to learn now about how things have changed? And how can I let go of what I think Microsoft is to learning what it really is right now? That's the open-minded piece. Learning from others. Uh, we talked about that. I'm sorry, what, what is your name? Christopher. Christopher. I'm just going to use first names here that we're, we're on an informal basis back at Sloan. Christopher uh, brought up the fact that there was a great deal about learning from others. And a big portion of what we talk about uh, here at Sloan is the broader ecosystem, is learning from a broader set of people, doing what we call vicarious learning, learning from others. If you're trying to up the quality standards in your organization, go find an organization that does it really, really well and learn from them. Why should you reinvent the wheel? Learn on the basis of others. Um, we do a lot of work here in the pharmaceutical industry. If you need to take your molecule and move it somewhere and you don't have that cap the capacity, go find a biotech company that might be able to help you along. So you have to see and learn from others. What do they know that I can learn from or that I can incorporate in what I do? 
create meaning and uncertainty. What, what the father of sense making is a guy by the name of Carl Weick. Uh, Weick, uh, he invented the name sense making, and he's written many books about it. Um, Part of, of sense making is not just that you're collecting lots of data, because collecting lots of data can actually get you confused, right? We've got all this new data coming in. So key to sense making is mapping it. What does it mean? What are the trends? What are the patterns? What are the priorities? What is this data telling me? Sense making is not just about let's get a lot of data. It's pulling it together, having lots of people look at it and interpret it and say, OK, what's the frame? What's the map? What does it look like? And that's really important. Um, I always tell the story of map making. It's, it's uh, well, we're tight on time, but I'll tell a story anyway. Um, leadership and storytelling go hand in hand. Uh, some of you have probably heard the story before, but I'll go on nonetheless. So Carl Weick tells the story. There's an army group in Spain, and they come to Switzerland to engage at Alpine training. It's the first day. They've never been in the snow before. They've never had to, to do anything. It's the first day out, and this little group gets separated. It's a beautiful sunny day. There's snow all over, nice peaks everywhere. First day out, this little group gets separated. And all of a sudden, there's this huge storm that comes. And it's snowing, and it's dark, and it's cloudy. And they can't see anything. And they begin to panic. They've got one little poncho to give them a little bit of protection. And so everybody's just getting more and more nervous. And they're in different parts of this, this little sheltered area, trying to think, uh, uh, what's going to happen to us? They'll find us in the spring, all frozen. Uh, we're going to die, whatever. Um, until one of the people in the group pulls out of his little day pack a map. And so they all come together, and they look at the map. And whenever there's a clearing, they say, OK, two peaks there, peak, valley, peak, valley, peak, valley there. So they try to figure out where they are. They pinpoint the, the place, and they start planning how it is they're going to get out of there once the snow stops. When it stops, they tie themselves together, and they get themselves out, and they don't end up where they think they should, but they end up in a town. And they go and report into the commander, who says, well, how did you survive? And they say, well, we had a map. And they give him the map. And he goes, hmm, well, this is actually a map of the Pyrenees, not the Alps. <laughs> and the moral of the story is, if you're tired and cold and scared, any old map will do. Any old map will do. Why is that? What does the map give you? Hope. hope. It gives you hope. All right, we can get out of here. We know where we are. We know where we're going. It gives you hope. What else does it do? Focus. It gives you focus. Everybody is all looking over here. Now we're focusing. What is the situation at hand? What are we going to do in this situation? From thinking to action, it starts moving you into a focused, way of thinking about the problem you are in. Anything else? Changing mindset from fear to creativity. Yes, from fear to action, from fear to hope. Um, it's a very major change. Now, because we're at MIT, all the engineers always come to me and say, oh, no, a bad map is worse than no map at all, because it takes you in the wrong direction, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and Weick talks at great lengths about this dilemma, the dilemma of getting it right. And what he will say is, A, you never get it right. We're mirroring a reality that's messy, and so we never get it right anyway. And two, what you have to understand is that your map is not reality. It's your picture of reality. And as such, you have to test it out, right? So you have to test it. Is this real? So those, these guys, they went and they stopped someplace where there was supposed to be a fork in the road, and there was no fork because they had the wrong map. So that required them sort of doing a little bit more sense making. OK, if we go here or there, what does it mean? So it's open to being flexible in what you find and then changing the map as needed. Yes? I feel like in sense, the example you gave is basically keep it simple, right, and make people focus. And, but I feel like in this world where the data, there's an exponential amount of data, solutions need to honor complexity, but leadership needs to be simple. And I'm curious how you think about that 
as a model because the oversimplification mm -hmm. is a massive blind spot <clears throat> that we see in leaders. <clears throat> they keep it so simple that then the, you know something happens that destroys the business. Well, the way in which Wyke talks about this this issue of complexity is that he talks about sense making as moving through three distinct phases. The, the first is you have a simple answer because you don't really know the situation in depth with all of its parameters. But to the extent that you are then going out and collecting all the, that data and, and pulling in the complexity. So it's simplicity to complexity to a different kind of simplicity. It is a simplicity that is built out of complexity and honors that complexity and also enables you to open up the map and say, OK, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about sense making. There are books written about sense making, right? So I'm saying sense making, here are some things to do. But if you want more, here are sites where you can go. If you want to apply this, maybe you want to think about some other things as well. So it's just the entry map that is your sense making. Uh, the, the, I love the, you know, um, in Apollo 13, they've got a, the, the, the rocket is stuck here, and they have to get it here to Earth. And their simple sense making is, where, where is Apollo 13 on this graphic? So it's, it's moving as they go. And how well is it doing, or are they doing? So it's a very simple depiction. So everybody in that room at Mission Controls knows where things are. But it's very simple. But there are 25 groups analyzing each little piece of equipment and so on and so forth. So it's simple, but you don't have to mask the complexity. Does that make sense? OK. And the last thing is experiment and test assumptions. Because we don't know if it's right, because we can't always predict, lots and lots of companies are running experiments all the time. Uh, Li and Fung is a company we worked with, and they opened up from large cities at the coast to smaller cities inland. Uh, they didn't know if Western or Eastern materials were going to um, if the same buying patterns were going to hold across those two locations. So they went into the, inter, uh, into the interior and smaller towns. They opened up two different kinds of stores, one with Western goods, one with Eastern goods, to experiment. We're assuming that they're going to want the same things inland as in the coastal cities. Turns out that assumption was wrong, and they had to ship. But rather than just move, they tested their assumptions. So a big part of sense making is testing what you think is going to be in the future against what might actually be. OK, um, just a couple of minutes. Same partners spend just two minutes. Given what we just talked about in sense making, thinking about your own job, what is some sense making that you may need to do right now? What are you not looking at that you need to look at, whether it's the competition, the customer, uh, someone out there who's further along in something than you are, um, somewhere that you're closed and need to open up, um, whatever. Two minutes, one minute each. What sense making do you need to do? Um, OK, so you have your work cut out for you. Um, can we hear maybe just from a couple of people as to what, what came out of that? What are, what are you going to be working on? What's missing in your organization? It's funny, we can, I, I use um, actually not just these things, but a little deck of cards. There's an exercise uh, that we do just like this. And um, if you give those cards to folks at Google, if you give it to them um, from, is it Steelcase, um, organizations that are known for their innovation, People will come and say, well, we have pretty much almost all of these. Um, they work on what has to be augmented. Uh, and then there are other organizations that have basically none of these things. Um, and so it does seem to differentiate cultures of innovation from those that are not. Cultures where learning is important, where the individual is important, and where innovative practice is important. Um, so anyway, just hear from one or two people about what, um, what they're going to work on. Yes? Very, very loudly. So I don't know if I have to talk about mine or about his. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is an organization in which we give you lots of autonomy. So you get to choose what you want to say. In this organization, I think that they have to work on the people.
people development. Coaching and people development, it's a large retailer, online retailer, you can imagine which one. <laughs> And, uh, oh, yeah, and that one doesn't spend much time coaching, no, yeah. and people development. It seems it's an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my organization, oh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess, I guess transparency. <clears throat> Transparency. Well, so that's a very interesting one. For a lot of uh, companies that are making this transition from the bureaucratic to command and control to more distributed learning um, networked organizations, very often, uh, it's interesting, working with those companies, the first thing they will focus on is transparency. Because transparency is related to trust. And if you don't have that, then other kinds of changes may not happen. Uh, so we did a, a long um, change process at, at an old line company. And th that was the first two years were all about creating transparencies in the process of how do we evaluate new products? How do we uh, promote people? How do we decide what the business models are going to be? Being more open about the decision making process and then inviting other people into it. So, um, so that's a very interesting choice. OK, yeah. yeah. For me, the number one thing would be people connecting inside and outside the organization. I work in a traditional manufacturing <coughs> industrial company. Mm -hmm. and they always look inwards. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, they all believe that uh, you know, we have a high level of efficiency, productivity, innovation. And that's not the case. Yep. So going out, uh, again, we have 300 biotech companies within, um, I think, a one-mile radius of here, plus all the big, um, the big drug companies, Pfizer and Takeda, and now Takeda Shire. And, um, and we work quite a bit with them all about creating X teams, getting externally focused, doing their external sense making, because that's been the, the road to success, is creating partnerships with academic institutions, between pharma and biotech, uh, between labs that are doing testing and the folks that need the testing. So a lot of uh, work on externalization or moving, moving outside. OK, um, so. Um, because we're here and we, we take a, a systems perspective, this is the land of system dynamics, the other thing that came out of this research on these organizations, it's not just that they have those three types of leaders in them, but those three are, first of all, interdependent. You can't create confident leaders who are innovating if you don't have the right culture to, to reward them, and you don't have the coaching needed. So it's not like you can pick one thing and assume that that's going to make the change. It's a system. And these systems reinforce each other over time. The other thing is, if you free up people to be able to find their own solutions to problems that they see, to challenges that they see, you give them autonomy. Basically, what you do is let people, they're voting with their feet. They're choosing, OK, well, three people have ideas, and everybody's free to choose. And there are three ideas, but only two of them get followership. Then those, that is a way of creating a prediction market. That's saying that all those people who are making those choices are bets about where the environment is going to go. And so that's giving you information on what might be the best solutions going forward in that uncertain world. So it is a creation within your organization of a kind of prediction market, which I think is a very cool idea. The other thing we see is that this, as you have people going out and doing their sense making, it's almost like an ant colony, where the ants will send scouts out to say, you know, where is it dangerous? Where is their food? What's a good place to go? They're all out there. And when someone finds something good, they come back and the ants follow, right? They don't go where the, the ant died, right? That was a bad thing. So they go and they follow, and there are ways of following in these colonies. And so just like that, having all these sense makers helps you to find good directions to move in the external environment. OK, we have just a few minutes left. So um, 
uh, just to remind you, leader, leadership signature, sense maker, leading X teams away from toxic leadership toward problem driven leadership and leader as architect. Those are the sort of five key takeaways uh, from today. And we have just a couple of minutes for any questions, comments, thoughts, reactions, whatever. Yes? Transparency. Transparency, okay. I can tell that he's he's not happy about this idea, not right? Not he's not. girded up here for a conflict. So let's let's have it, let's have it. With, with my organization, it has become kind of like a narcotic. It has become sorry? Like a narcotic. A narcotic transparency? Everybody wants to know everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so not talking about like radical transparency and sharing salaries and all that, but if a decision, if, if for example, if I'm a team leader and I make a decision and I don't give I exaggerate a little bit excruciating rationale for people who might. Okay, so. so set, I, we've set up some type of system of transparency that we might be too far. Okay, so, so I, I want to say transparency is often about sort of more, not everybody needing to know everything, but transparency in how decisions are made. People don't like to put, let's say, proposals in for new product ideas and not to get answers back or realize what are the criteria, who's making the decision. It's like this magic thing. And so you want transparency in process. <laughs> that said, again, I'll go back to Gore, which we studied in depth, because they're the poster child of distributed leadership. Not everybody knows about everything. Uh, there is, in fact, a, a, a rule, a simple rule, it's called need to know, um, that when you get um, information that may be, um, it, you don't want everybody to know about, that might be too private or, or issues, it's need to know. Uh, and in fact, uh, once the CEO was, was in China and, and wanting to understand a new process that they were using to, to cut the fa their fabrics company. To, uh, well, they do a lot of things, fabrics and other things with this, uh, with this molecule. Um, and she was going, oh, that's so interesting. Well, how did you figure that out? And what's this process? And where are you using it? And the person was, was like not saying anything. And, and she asked again. And he wasn't saying anything. And, and she asked again. And, and then he, he timidly said, do you really need to know this? Uh, so it was a norm that was deeply embedded in the culture um, that some information, not all information is transparent. So it's t making the calls about what do you need people to know in the processes at hand to feel like it's an even-handed, well-run organization. OK, anyone else? Questions? Yes, last one. Just share a uh, thought, maybe a name. I see my organization that we're moving in this direction, although we don't really use all this frame or anything like that. And I see that that's slide, some of the things we are doing that, partially probably. But the thing that I, fi I find it my most hard to do is that both, uh, I think everybody kind of expects from the sea level to move in that direction. It's like not everybody, very few people really assume for themselves that we're moving in some direction to change the way we work to a more, let's say, uh, people-driven organization like this. And at the same time, even the sea level, they can kind of they tend to think that uh, the sea level should be the one to move all these things. And, and it's very hard because when I teach things like that, you are kind of moving things that generally are in the sea level to the teams, and how, how do you move the teams if right. the sea level and the teams are not? Well, the so, it's, so it's, it's a big irony that most of the organizations that have created these kinds of systems created them from very autocratic directive leaders, uh, that, that the founders of these companies, if you look at the founder of Gore, he was escaping from Dow, hated their bureaucracy, and mandated this kind of operation. Um, so so that, is, that is the irony. If we are working with companies, we typically work at multiple levels, because it's not going to start here. You have to have support from the sea level, or it's not going to happen. So the best thing to do is have a multi-level 
intervention where everybody's learning and changing at the same time, or it starts here and, and goes through here and cascades down. So you cannot do it really isolated at the bottom without the top. And the top is often the most difficult to change because they say they want to move in this direction, but there's a lot of what we call immunity to change because it's actually scary to give up power. Um, so, um, and that will be our final word because we're out of time, but uh, thank you guys very much and welcome back. So, yeah. Oh, and by the way, Thank you. Uh, at the break, uh, to give us more time, I got this as a gift for, for being here. So thank you again for that, too. <laughs> also, the papers that Professor Ingram oh, mentioned right. will be posted on the mobile app by the end of the day. So within her session, you should find them under the document section. And I think a round of applause, because this, yeah. this thing has been organized in a way.